In 2011, I traveled from the United States to the island of Borneo in Indonesia for a six-month adventure doing anthropological research. I was lucky to be able to see some of the most exotic and beautiful scenery in the world, featuring active volcanoes and tropical forests. But it wasn't easy, and I faced many obstacles along the way. I invite you to share the experience of overcoming fear, adversity, culture shock, and going on to gain knowledge of a foreign world and having the adventure of a lifetime. My purpose was to study the behavioral ecology of non-human primates. My personal favorite were the orangutans. I was also able to see many other animals on this journey, including pets that seem strange to me but fit right in in the native culture. But the most important element of this journey was embracing the new culture. <coughs> Getting to your study site is an adventure in itself. From arriving in airports at 3 a.m. and being completely isolated, to traveling in dragon boats while looking out into a beautiful sunset. Other times, you catch a flight that drops you off on the tarmac where huge jet refueling tankers are whizzing by just feet from you. When you are on solid ground and can hit the streets, the adventure doesn't stop but gets even more intense. What kind of road is this? <laughs> Phase two requires getting the required permits, nobody's favorite part of the process. It's good to get an interpreter that can converse with the security guards to get easy clearance to the governmental buildings. I didn't want to argue with them considering the fact they have huge automatic weapons. Okay, I'm in a green taxi and I'm on the way to the immigration building. Okay, we're outside of the immigration building in San Marindo. We're just After getting in the buildings, it's very important to be patient. And once the documents are stamped, be polite and shake hands. Okay, so now we're at the final step of Jakarta. I just have to take the SPP form into the police office and we are done. So I came to get an Indonesian cell phone okay. at the wall and I realized that they're selling animals out front. Okay. Now I can understand on the street, you know, maybe selling goldfish, they even have rabbits, but there's two things that I'm really surprised about I want to come show you. Here in Indonesia, the thing that I'm studying are primates. They actually sell monkeys right out in front of the mall. And then there's another one up here. The food in Indonesia is awesome. One reason for this is because it's so diverse. There are over 6,000 populated islands and the regional cuisines are made up from both native cultural and foreign influences. It's like taking the best flavors from Indian, Chinese, Middle Eastern and European foods and putting them out on the same plate. There are five different cooking methods. Goreng, frying, bakar, grilling, tumis, stir frying, ribus, boiling, and last, kukis, which is steaming. My personal favorite was the ayam bakar. It was the best grilled chicken I've ever had. The flavors are so intense that there have been wars fought over them. There were many deaths in the 17th century due to the spice wars on these islands. In part due to the exotic flavors, but also due to the fact it's the only place in the world where they are found. At street festivals, the vendors are very friendly and sometimes encourage foreigners like myself to come behind the scenes and see how the food is made. I learned to eat as much as possible before and after going to the field site because oftentimes the food supply runs low and you aren't always certain where the next meal will come from. But fortunately, when you have the chance to be in a city, you get the opportunity to indulge in a flavor extravaganza. I also found it amazing that the best food I ate came from the local street vendors. I did have a chance to dine at restaurants, but the flavors were not as intense and you didn't get the unique experience of interacting with the vendors. It reminded me of food trucks that can be found on some street corners in the USA, but the atmosphere on the streets of Indonesia was much more personable and you could really get a sense of the culture through eating with the locals. They put a lot of pride and love into their food and it really shows. The way I first picked up on the language was ordering food and learning new words on how to describe the flavors. 
Two very important words in this process are pedas, which means spicy, and manis, which means sweet. There's a kind of red sauce that goes with the meals, and I was mispronouncing it for three months before I was corrected. I was calling it samba. I was told in a lighthearted manner that samba is a Latin American dance, and sambul is the Indonesian sauce that I was eating. Ramadan is the ninth month in the Islamic year and is observed around the world by fasting. After the fast is over, there is a celebration called Idul Fitri, where the best foods come out. One of these special foods is a soup called Katupat. In it, there is chicken, potatoes, noodles, and spices. There is a kind of competition to see who can eat the most bowls of the soup after the long month of fasting. The entire family participates and comes together during this special time of the year. Traveling to the field site via the dirt roads was one of the biggest challenges faced on this expedition. If we were driving in a new Range Rover with fully functional four-wheel drive, it wouldn't have been that daunting. However, most of the vehicles I traveled in were not the top-of-the-line four-wheel drive machines that would have made the trip easier. Sometimes, motorcycles would come through and make it seem easy. So we're a little bit past the portal, which is kind of the entry point to get into the camp. And our four-wheel drive isn't working as good as it should right now, so the truck is currently stuck. So John, Apa John Sedang de Tolong. Amblas. Amblas. Yeah. Stuck. I wanted to ask John what happened and who was coming to help. Buh. Buh? Yeah, buh. B U R? <laughs> B U U. Tiga. Dua. Satu. Who needs an expensive Range Rover when you have human power? <laughs> Although when this is the case, you do need a portable shower. Why you mandi? Why you kuat? Other times, you are faced with different challenges and improvisations need to be made in order to get by. Tumbang. Tumbang. Pohon tumbang. Tidak, we cannot because it's too dangerous. Uh -huh. If we cut this, open that is going to go down. Yes. Yeah, that is very dangerous. Uh -huh. so, so we just going open that. Oh, with the car? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Jalan Beru. Jalan Beru. Uh, we're going to go see the rice field of Boney where his family works and makes rice. Uh, it's about five kilometers away, so we're going to go there on the motorcycle. The further you travel and the closer you get to the field site, the more native cultural lifestyle you get to witness. I was lucky enough to have Boney invite me to see where his family maintains their farm. Boney was excited to show me around and tell me all about it. Rice, banana, and rubber. Forever. So this is the cassava tree. And you say that the roots, you ma makan hmm. the root. Oh no, you titi it, it's okay, but you um maybe you, you eat the you root. You make can try uh, to do the cassava. Okay, mukay. Okay. Well, well. To to make in the fire. Oh, we, we will we will make the cassava. Okay. <coughs> okay. Oh, hati hati cassava, and then cassava. Yeah, makan cassava, and I uh. Menam, 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 yeah, cassava again. Oh, and then you plant the new cassava. No, yeah, uh, month. Tidak tahun, um, berapa bulan? How many months? Well, five. Lima bulan, mm -hmm. and then. Can to get root. The tree will be back in Lima bulan, five months. Okay. So now kita makan. Okay. 
I want to make cassava. Cassava dan mando. <laughs> dan boni also. Dan boni. <laughs> Tidak suka terau. So now the ikan yeah, makan. <laughs> Boiling water. Oh, just water, air. Yep. Air and oil. Oil uh, for uh, ikan. Oh, chill out the fish. Yep. Uh, labu. Babu. In, in English, I forget what this is. Yeah, babu. Champanja. It's like beans and peas. And is this ayam? Ayam, yeah. onions and garlic. And this is the, the bamboo with nasi inside. Bamboo and rice. I was very happy that Boney invited me to see this process and joined in his family activities. This is an opportunity that not everyone receives. The name of the native people in Kalimantan are Dayak. Most visitors are invited to see the village leaders, which is an interesting experience. But it's also worthwhile to see how the other members of the society live. And Gasafa. In the sambal, maybe I want to take sambal. With sambal. Hot and the delicious. Hot and delicious. Mm, yeah. Um, tastes similar to a potato. You know, potato. I don't know. Maybe a potato. Yeah, like a like a sweet potato. Yeah. Yeah, sweet potato. Very very good. Makanan or not? Hmm. Do we have makanan? Okay, it's Saturday, July second, and we are about to head off to the forest. Here is the truck. It took about two hours to get it started, but once it got started, we're just going to leave it running until we get there. And hopefully this will get us there with no problems. We are on the way to the forest. I am riding with Yen. He's a very good driver. Just looking at this road again brings back memories of that long journey to the research station. Come on, engine. Yeah, I was just told by Yen that the last road that we were on was smooth and nice because it's maintained by logging companies. And now the road that we're on is very, very rough. And as you can see, the truck is currently broken down because we just went through a big mud pile and rev the engine up so we have to let it cool down and hopefully it'll be okay. But I was just thinking to myself that it's uh, the symbolism here that the nice roads that are very smooth lead to the destruction of the earth, the logging company, and the very rough and hard roads to get through are the roads that lead to hopefully helping the planet. So both literally and figuratively it's a very easy road to destroy the planet, but it's a very hard road to actually save the planet. Uh, it, was, it was just, it's pretty amazing when you're actually here and you can see it. Uh, it's a lot different than, you know, when you're just reading about it or watching it on TV back, back in the States. But when you're actually here and see it firsthand, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty, in, it's an incredible feeling. But again, here's the, the road that we have to start up. This is where... We are headed. We couldn't get up the road that goes to Wahea, so we tried to go to a mechanic, and the mechanic couldn't fix the car, so now we have to go back to Slimbing to try to either fix this car, or try to get another one that might be able to make it up there tonight. Uh, so hopefully everything works out, and we'll still be able to get there tonight, but we have to go try to work on this car, get another car, have some food, and maybe try to get there tonight. Running and jumping all 
Okay, so the car was going to need to get fixed by a mechanic, and the mechanic couldn't come until tomorrow, and even if he came, there was no guarantee that it was going to get fixed. So, uh, Yen got a rental car that he, uh, he found. This driver is Philip. Philip. And? Jeffrey. And Jeffrey. And, and they are taking me to the, uh, to the forest now. Hopefully we'll be there uh, before too late. It's about 6.30 and it's starting to get dark, so it'll be an interesting ride in the dark. We'll, uh, we'll see how it goes, but hopefully we'll get there in one piece. I don't quite know how to explain how this happened, but the, the door got caught when we were trying to go through and we got stuck. So now we have to dig the door out of a root. Arrived to the forest late last night. Uh, I just got a couple hours of sleep. I wanted to show you how the truck situation ended up after we finally made it in, uh, but we were minus one door. Uh, we were lucky it was only the door. Driving on that road at night is not a good idea. But we made it in one piece, and after a little rest, it was time to get to work. The work mainly consisted of following a group of red langer monkeys from sunup to sundown. When some of their leftovers fell from the trees, we would collect the samples and mark the tree with tape as well as record its position on the GPS. After a few more hours of following the group, taking behavioral notes, and collecting samples, it eventually turns to evening and the monkeys go to sleep. Once we are certain they have found their resting spot for the night, it's our turn to go back to camp and get some rest. This is usually time to refuel and get energy for the following day. However, because the research station is so remote, it is difficult to have consistent resupply trips with food. There is no refrigeration, so after a few weeks, you get down to just rice and some flavorings. The first few days were very difficult, not just for myself, but my assistants as well. It's July 7th. It's our second day of following the monkeys. Uh, yesterday was a very, very hard day. Larissa, the previous assistant, said it's one of the hardest days she's had in her whole six months here. Um, but today, uh, it's a little easier. They're resting right now. I just want to show you one of them that's visibly resting. And then what we have to do is every 15 minutes, we have to write down where their location or distance is. We have to write down their activities, which we use codes for, and then give some notes, like if they're resting, visibly resting and then once they do start to move we have the map of trails that we would like to follow but monkeys don't follow <laughs> trails so most of the times we have to go and cross these red dots which represent the rivers or the white spots which is just dense forest that we have to cut through and basically that's following these guys we have to follow them through thick forest, look at them up in the trees, and record their behavior. Right now, the, uh, the langers are in the middle of a feeding bout. Up, see if we can identify any of them. Well, we are right under them. Oh! Little displacement there. I'll write that down in my notes. And if I can't see them, then I have a spotter here. This is Akem. He's, uh, he's very good. He has a better eye than, than me at the forest. Hopefully in a couple months I'll, I'll get my eyes up to his level. But for now, we're working as a team. Sometimes out here, after you write a bunch of notes for the day, the pencil gets dull. But out in the jungle, you don't have a pencil sharpener. So you have to improvise. <laughs> <laughs> you need a sharp pencil to write, especially when the monkeys oh make God. huge jumps. Oh, 
<laughs> and after oh, running man, and jumping good. all around the forest, it's always nice to see them go to sleep. Because that means the workday has come to an end, and it's time to get some rest yourself and get ready to do it all again the next day. But just because the sun goes down, it doesn't mean the action is over. There are always activities in the forest. <laughs> hati hati. It's about 4.45 on Sunday. We're about to go out and chase the, the monkeys. I just wanted to show you what the gibbons sound like. This is the wake-up call that you get in the forest. The forest is amazing. It's full of awesome creatures, ranging in all shapes, sizes, and colors. But sometimes it can be very scary and dangerous. Walk to Medihat. Yeah. Kamu Medihat. Yeah. This animal was bitten by a viper and spent the last minutes of its life trying to be comforted by the Dayak. <laughs> Spending time in the forest teaches you a lot. Not only about life and death, but most importantly, what it means to be human. Being at one with nature and feeling connected. September 30th, about 8.40 a.m., and that was the sound of a orangutan call. Hey, this is pretty exciting. I'm uh, tracking a orangutan right now. It's about 50 meters away from me, and I'll think I'll be able to get a visual pretty soon on camera. This was probably the first time this orangutan has been seen by human beings. It's a pretty scary experience because he was throwing huge <laughs> branches at us whenever he got the chance. Throwing very but you big can't blame him. If you put yourself in his position, it's the smart thing to do. We're the invaders of his territory. This is a crazy feeling to actually see an orangutan in the wild. 
but after a little while, he realized we weren't going to harm him and he settled down. Being able to look into the eyes of a wild orangutan really drove home the point of studying these wonderful creatures. Understanding their evolution and behavior gives us tremendous insight into our own origins. Research is a funny thing. Once you finally get the hang of it and start getting adjusted, it's time to leave. But it will be okay, as long as there is an opportunity to come back. Being able to see what a wonderful experience it is traveling to a remote field site will hopefully drive home the point that research is fun and important. However, there are serious threats to the environment and the incredible species that live there that might make future opportunities like this one impossible. Okay, so Boney and I just, we just climbed the, the mountain Whew, pretty tiring, it was straight up, maybe about, what do you think, 200 meter? I think about 200 meter, right Boney? Look it. <laughs> yeah, palm oil everywhere. Yeah, smog going up, you see the, once there was a huge forest, now they're all plantations for palm oil. You can see the factory right there, manufacturing the palm oil. But pretty much as far as your eye can see, it's all palm oil. It not only hurts the environment and animals, but also the local people. PT Kapas bergerak di bidang penanaman kelapa sawit yang lokasinya berada di Long Teman ya, ya Long Teman. di Long Teman Estate dan kalau lahan keluarga dari nenek dari Kensing itu 30 hektar sedangkan dari kami yang dirusak itu ada 6,7 hektar yang digunakan untuk pembibitan itu sekitar 8 hektar tapi tidak ada penyelesaian untuk kasus itu Lahan terbengkelai, dirusak begitu saja. Padahal di situ ada banyak tanaman berharga, hutan rakyat yang dibuat oleh masyarakat Selabing. Antara lain, gaharu ada, pulin ada, kapur, meranti, e, rotan, dan macam-macam. Kayu-kayu itu pun digunakan untuk cadangan keluarga, untuk membuat rumah. Karena apa? Harga material kayu saat ini semakin sulit sehingga masyarakat untuk mendapatkan kayu harus menanam sendiri tapi kami menanam sudah mulai besar dirusak oleh perusahaan tanpa permisi tanpa ganti rugi ke kami bagaimana penyelesaiannya ini terak kelapa sawit ditahan oleh keluarga karena tidak ada penyelesaian oleh PT Kapas perusahaan kelapa sawit We must take the difficult road and make intelligent, conscious choices. We cannot continue ignoring the elephant in the room. We must move forward carefully. Let us always strive to feel connected and hopefully we will have a bright future.